So thank you all. Okay, just a second. Good afternoon now. I, I should have been intimidating being caught uh, between uh, Dr. Crawford, a very prestigious speaker, and lunch. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that uh, we've had some, uh, a really great talk already, and you're probably getting hungry. So um, what we'll try and do is, uh, uh, Professor Crawford actually already touched on some of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, so what we're going to do is um, talk a little bit about maybe some of the psychological treatments that you heard earlier on, um, uh, and the way we manage some of the behavioural symptoms, um, particularly the, the, the cognitive and the emotional pieces from a psychological perspective. So um, I'm a neuropsychologist working down at the National Neuroscience Centre in Beaumont in Dublin, where we are um, slowly trying to get a multidisciplinary clinic together with a colleague of mine, Professor Orla Hardeman. Before that, I worked in the Huntington's unit at the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability in Pugney in London for many years. So we worked with people with, with Huntington's disease for a long time, um, and seem to be trying to get services, particularly in, in Ireland, set up um, for a very long time. But we're, we're, we're um, optimistic that we're going to get there somewhere, sometime soon. So I suppose what I want to talk about, um, and Huntington's is a family affair, essentially, to quote another person. So it's, it's, it's a, um, something that everybody experiences and Huntington's family experience. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the cognitive difficulties. I'm going to start a little bit about some of the difficulties which are maybe not Huntington's, which are normal. Um, and um, a little bit about why we have some of those difficulties. I have a lot of slides. I tend to over prepare slides. So um, don't worry about having to keep up with everything. I can send out anything that you want or I can modify them. If anybody's looking for any of the information, we can send them out. Okay, so don't worry about it. Just try and uh, absorb what you can. If you have any questions, Please ask them. This is this is an event for you, you guys. So if you want to ask about something else, if I can help or if I can give any information, please let me know. So, um, so look, what we're talking about are changes in the human brain, and the human brain is an amazing thing. Um, it allows us to experience everything. It allows us to sit here, experience these events, feel love, imagine into the future, feel fear, all these things that go on all the time. But it is, it is vulnerable. <coughs> So I think what we've even seen recently is the pace of cultural and technological change in the last 30 years and more have outstripped our brain's capacity to keep up with all of this. So all of us know that it is um, evolution can't keep up with changing the, the, the speed of which the world changes. So our brains make mistakes. It still is vulnerable to making mistakes. We, we, have, we make errors. Uh, we forget things. Um, and this is just a brief just overview, I suppose, about the various different parts. I think you've heard a little bit about this already that different parts of the brain do different things. Um, and in Huntington's disease, what we see are the changes that are involved, in particularly things like concentration, um, high-level reasoning, planning, problem-solving, and aspects of emotion are affected by the disease. Um, and deep down in the middle brain is where we see most of the changes in the early stages of the disease. Now, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. But I think the important thing as well is that the brain has been studied for a very long time. And we've learned a lot about the brain, but there's still a huge amount that we don't know about. And there's a huge amount of research going on. And this is why clinical trials have difficulties, because we're still trying to learn how best to measure change, how best to measure outcome, how to look at what aspects of any disease that we want to change, and uh, how, to, how to record these properties. And you'll hear that over the day. I'm going to stop wandering soon. I can feel it. I think the desire to start moving around is happening. Um, so what we want to do is um, work out what are the changes to do with Huntington's, what are the normal changes that are to do with um, a brain and, and being human, and how can we change them. So I suppose I'm going to start with some of the things that we, we all know can go wrong. The human brain is very vulnerable to um, making mistakes. And we can get fooled very easily, we can see illusions, um, we, can, we can make mistakes constantly, we can lose our train of thought. These are all things I've been gathering over the last few years that everybody does. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to ask for a, for a show of hands. Has anybody, anybody done any of those things? <laughs> Great. So this is really important to remember because certainly when we're working with people very early in the disease, pre-manifest parts of the disease, or where people maybe haven't had the genetic test, or they're well. There's a, there's a worry that people are um, looking for symptoms, looking for signs, looking for things that might indicate the onset of disease. That's really scary uh, when that happens, because you might forget something. You might run up the stairs and forget why you went there. You might lose something. And it causes a lot of distress for people. But there's a huge amount of normal memory dumping, normal, normal memory loss, mm. normal memory mistakes. So what we want to do is help people understand those, that there's a normal amount of loss all the time. And as I said, every one of those I have done, um, and I've done a lot. So, uh, maybe that's a more about me, but I think, you know, we, have, we've, we do forget things, we make mistakes, we lose our train of thought, we, we, we all, we, uh, these are normal things that we do. And the more anxious we get, the more worried we get about something, the more that happens. 
it's using my train of thought all over the place now today, uh, because I can't wander. So I'm losing my train of thought all the time because anxiety is creeping in and that's stopping me from focusing and concentrating on what I'm meant to be doing. So don't worry about those things. Right? These, are, these are normal things. So this is what you need to talk to your, your team, your, your, the people looking after you and working with you. So what we see now is that we have changes in the brain. So when I wander over here, can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. Well, we see changes in the brain from Huntington's, but we also see what are called modifiable factors. We see things that can be changed. So you've heard and you will hear about great treatments that are coming in Huntington's. It's a very exciting time to be working in Huntington's disease. There's a huge amount going on. But there are things that we can modify, and you've heard a little bit about that already. Things that we can change uh, that maybe are due to the fact that how we manage our memory, how we manage our daily routine, how we manage our sleep, and our anxiety, these can all be uh, changed and modified, and we can actually do an awful lot to minimize the impact. Now what's happening now is, particularly in psychological treatments, for any chronic illness, one of the models that's happening is something called chronic illness management, or chronic disease management. I don't know if anybody's heard of this, or really been part of any of these programs? No, okay, that's not unusual with the Huntington's audience. So in, in other chronic conditions, um, you think things like diabetes or even chronic pain. This is the model that we're now starting to, to use. It's a chronic illness management model. So the idea is you have an interaction between your disease, the treatments, and then the world around you and how you manage those. And we want to train people to try and manage the things that they can manage, take control of the things that they can take control of, so the disease itself does not become everything about the individual. You're not Huntington's disease. You are much more than that. You're, a, you're an individual who has a whole life and a family and everything around you. What we want to do is help people access that and get access to treatments for that. So this is the model. You can see this vicious circle that we talk about. You can cut this vicious circle anywhere, really. But you have your illness. You have the, maybe the movements, the psychiatric problems, the cognitive problems that you have. That might be associated with the work our way around the clock face there, really, with some depression and anxiety. That could interact with some thinking difficulties you might have. That could then affect your function. You maybe you might not be able to drive. Maybe you might have difficulty socialising. People might be saying that you're drunk or that they cause they don't they, 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 they don't understand the symptoms that you do are presenting with. It might affect your job or your study. That increases your, I suppose, maybe not engaging with the world, you don't want to go out as much anymore, you feel a bit more frustrated and irritable. That makes you less likely to do things, which means you're less able to do things. Maybe you don't want to go for treatment, and that that continues the, the effect on the movement and the, and the train of the, the, the whole system goes round and round. Does that seem familiar to people? Does that kind of resonate? Does that ring a bell? Because I think this is something that we're seeing in a whole range of chronic illnesses, that eventually the disease itself and the world and how you interact with the world come together to put this vicious circle together. Now why that's really important is because we can change some of those. And you can probably see already from looking at that, there are changes that we can put into place. There are things we can start to do. And I have this, I think this is applicable both for the person themselves with Huntington's and family members. Because we also need to remember we need to care for the caregivers, we need to care for the carers, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So, the psychological difficulties that we see, and we've been working with Huntington's over the years, are an interaction between the changes in the brain that you heard, and the way the person responds to those changes, and the way the world that they live in responds to that. Does that make sense? Okay, so we can see, and we've heard already, about aspects of the thinking about behaviour, how you interact with other people. That's sometimes even more irritable, and maybe misinterpret what's being said. So, I've had situations where people get into some difficult situations because maybe they're out, they're in a bar, and somebody thinks that they're drunk, and somebody bangs into them, they misinterpret what the person has done, the situation gets out of hand, and before you know it, you've got a very big situation happening. And that's just one type of situation. Those sort of situations happen a lot. They can even happen within families. And it's nobody's fault, it's a mistake, it's a misunderstanding, but it can cause a lot of distress and a lot of upset for everybody. Um, so, We've heard about the features of Huntington's disease, and I'm going to go into a lot of these. You've already heard all this already. The three aspects that we really pay attention to are the motor features, the aspects of the psychiatric and emotional, and the cognitive features. So again, we're saying the same thing over and over again. I'm going to talk about the thinking and the emotion piece. Right? Is, that, is this speed okay, or am I going too fast? We're okay? Um, so much to say. So the thinking aspects that we see are due to the changes in the brain affecting particularly things like thinking speed, Concentration, high level thinking. Now we call those, you see them in red, these are the ones you need to pay attention to, are the executive functions. Now the executive functions are very ground way of saying that's the brain to control everything else. So most of the time the brain is able to potter away, it does its, its own thing in autopilot. And most of us have been in that situation, even actually coming up today on the M1, I was in the autopilot for quite some time thinking about what I was going to say this morning. 
Uh, and then you suddenly realise that you've got to turn off the junction and wake up and you, you start thinking about where you're going and what you're doing and the sat nav reminds you where to go. So what happens is the executive function woke up and suddenly told me it's time to turn, you need to focus where you're going and pay attention to what you're doing. And this is what happens normally in the brain. The brain will, an awful lot of us are on autopilot all the time. Um, but in Huntington's disease, that executive doesn't necessarily kick in all the time. So sometimes, person, as you heard about perseverance, you, don't get, you get stuck in the same thing, find it hard to problem solve, find it hard to maybe be flexible if the situation changes. So you're great in a routine, but if there's any surprises or something is different, then the situation is a little bit harder to deal with. Now, it's really a magnification of what we see in other conditions as well. Thinking speed can be a difficulty as well. Because of the changes in the brain, it's a little bit slower. It's harder to, 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 to think of things fast, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get ideas up. I don't know if that makes sense. But that means that you can get overwhelmed very quickly because lots of stuff is coming at you, and your brain just isn't able to process it as fast as you need to process it. Now, we see that with age anyway, as people age. I'm already struggling with that. Um, as kids and everybody shouting at me, uh, you know, it, 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 we do get overwhelmed, but it just happens much earlier in Huntington's. You, you get, and it happens much quicker. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, this is a bit more complex aspect of the same thing, but mainly it's concentrating, thinking speed, and, and dealing with flexibility and novelty are the real issues that we want to try and do. So, the other things that we have to try and incorporate here is that we want to try and manage a chronic illness over the course of its, of its conditions and keep people well and independent as long as possible. <laughs> then there are the difficulties themselves with Huntington's, and then we have all the family issues that happen together. Because Huntington's is a complex family condition. We have different members with the disease, some people who don't know whether they have the disease or not, some people who do know but don't want to talk about it. We have family members who don't want to discuss it, different branches of the same family who don't want to discuss it, whereas some do. It's really complex and it's really tricky. And then we have all the ethics of genetics that you'll hear about that later as well whether somebody should get the test, whether somebody shouldn't get the test. If I get the test, will that tell somebody else that they have it already? So this is really complex and really emotional and really challenging. And I can even begin to try and understand or appreciate how, uh, how upsetting and difficult that, that, that must be. These cognitive difficulties can then lead to a whole range of other problems. Learning new information, as we heard already, getting frustrated with other people, feeling overwhelmed, maybe not being able to achieve the level that you thought you were going to be able to achieve because um, it's difficult and harder to, to uh, de deal with things. <coughs> that affects our confidence. We feel a bit lower in ourselves, we feel a bit down, not, and we're not willing, I suppose, or able then to be able to take chances or try new things. And that's why you need these treatments, and I'm going to talk to you in a minute. That's why you need to engage with your multidisciplinary team to get as much of that help as you possibly can. And uh, the one that really worries me is the avoidance piece. This is where people then, the world starts to shrink. And we see that in lots of mental health conditions, but we see it in Huntington's a lot. The world shrinks, people maybe don't go out so much, they don't want to go out so much, they stay at home, and that brings its own difficulties and challenges too. So when we're dealing with, so what I'm going to try and do is, is mix some of the symptoms with what we can do better and what's available at the moment from a psychological perspective. So the first thing is, don't overload people with lots of demands. So we have to balance the, with the piece with the apathy, so I would absolutely agree. There's no point sitting waiting for ages for something to happen because the energy just isn't there for the person to initiate it. But at the same time, little and often, or if you remember nothing else from what I'm talking about today, little and often is the key message that you have to remember. Small amounts of things done more frequently is much better than lots and lots of things done all at once. So I don't know if any of you have that situation where maybe you're feeling great, you're having a good day, you decide to take on lots of things. You're cleaning the house, doing the garden, going shopping, and then for about three days afterwards you're exhausted. Uh, and the brain just can't handle that. So you're much better at doing small amounts, break it up into a routine. Routine is also extremely important. Slow down. Don't rush. Don't do exactly what I'm doing now. Slow it down. Take it slowly. Take it calmly. Give people plenty of time to think and process. Okay? Because that's where you're going to see the result. And sometimes you can jump in. It's very easy to jump in if the person isn't responding. And that's very frustrating when you're trying to get the words out and suddenly somebody jumps in and completes the sentence. Um, reduce distraction. We know that lots of noise, lots of background um, stimulation, lots of distraction can lead to overwhelming any of us. So if any of us are trying to, if you've ever been you know, in a, in a, in a bar or a restaurant with lots of noise and the music is playing, there's ten people talking, there's six different conversations going on, it's very hard for your brain to do that. It's even harder in Huntington's disease to do that. So you're starting to build a picture here, plenty of rest. <coughs> also, when you're tired, when, you're having, when your processing speed is slow, when you're having to concentrate really hard on what everybody is saying, and when it's taking you that little bit longer to do it, you get tired really easy. 
I don't know if that rings a bell to anybody, but you can get overwhelmed, you get exhausted very quickly. Now, with, with some time and rest, you can recover, but it is very tiring. And once you get tired, the vicious circle starts. Because the more tired you get, the harder it is to concentrate, the more tired you get. So these are all modifiable things. These are all things that we can do something about. And we can change these, which is you know, not something often we can say in quantities, that we can change them and make, put some, some systems in place. There are great memory aids now. I mean, with the advent of smartphones and technology, it's fantastic. There's a huge amount of resources available for us to be able to support our memories. And people often worry, if I start using memory aids, if I start writing it down, will that mean my memory will get worse? No. It's use whatever resources that you can to help you. So use, use your smartphone, use your tablet. I love just going back to paper. The very act of sitting, making, making notes, writing out your diary, putting things in, actually really help your concentration. But don't be afraid to use aids to help you with anything that you need to do. There are so many resources, so many apps available now. And the other important thing is, in a talk like this, we're giving you very general information. And I think we already touched on it a moment ago. With Huntington's disease, there really is no uniform pattern. Everybody has a slightly different story. Everybody has a slightly different profile, different family background. And so there are differences in everybody. So we're giving you very generic, very general information. But it's, it's, everybody is different. And everybody has a slightly different pattern. So some of the things that we're going to talk about here, won't necessarily have to do with so these are just some, and I can give you these at another time, these are a little bit more complex. So these are just a bit more techniques that we have used or that we have developed to be able to improve your memory, to improve your concentration. They're all about really spending a little bit more time doing something and concentrating. But anybody who's ever done an exam at all in their life, it's the same sort of thing that you need to do at Huntington's. It's to focus, break down the material, put into smaller amounts of information and help your learning. Because that's really where we see the problem with Huntington's in memory. It's not that you're forgetting information. What happens is it's the difficulty for your brain getting the information in and then pulling it out quickly when it needs it. Once it's in there, it's really quite good at staying there. There's lots of different techniques, and this is really just to show you that there are other techniques, and I can send information up to anybody who might be interested in it. But there are lots of ways of improving. Now I'm touching on a side piece here, because we touched a little bit about it, and we've touched a bit already. But this is about the whole genetic test, and the, whole, the, the unique aspect of Huntington's is this, these challenges, the mental health, the emotional challenges of waiting. Um, and this is really tricky, this is really difficult to manage. How do you get on with your life? How do you participate in your life? The challenge of knowing if you have the genetic test early, that's a challenge to deal with. That's a challenge to, to wonder what the symptoms are. And, and I said, certainly for the people that I see coming into our clinics who are, who are upset and emotional and, and in the early stages, it's mostly about, is this a sign? Is this it? And, and more often than not, for many years, it's not at all. Um, then there's the challenge of not knowing. I decided not to go for the test but I don't know what's going to happen. When do, when do the symptoms begin? What will happen? How will I get on my life? And then obviously, if family members have seen somebody with somebody with Huntington's already, seeing the future in the past is a big worry for everybody. Will I end up like that? Is that how it's going to be? And these are really difficult and challenging existential and emotional things to deal with. But you need time and space to talk about that. And don't be afraid to ask about that. Don't be afraid to get the time to get the support to deal with that. Because these are really hard. And we can help you with these things. Uh, because these are really tricky things. You've already heard about the, the mental health aspects from Professor Crawford, so I'm going to spend any time with that, because uh, you're the expert. So what we want to do is try and give you a bit more information to look for time-wise. Am I okay? Somebody will throw something at me, will they? Can we come closer to the time? Patricia will throw her phone at me or a shoe or something. Um, so what we want to do is, as you say already, I'm repeat this a little bit, and this is a little bit of the memory strip strategy. Use your reminders and prompts. This is what I just did there, okay? We're using a reminder. Patricia's my external memory aid. She's going to tell me when it's time to go to stop. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And that's kind of what we're doing as well today. You'll hear the same thing coming across all the time because the more you hear it, the more, uh, the more it, it, uh, it's going to go in and it's going to stay, particularly with that type of difficulty. Small information, break down information into chunks. Okay, this is, have you ever heard, 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 heard of chunking? I'm having my speech error now. Okay, chunking is a very simple um, memory technique where you just break it down into small amounts of information. Actually, where you most notice it mostly is postcodes. So postcodes, as, as in their development, were, um, had a, a very famous psychologist, Alan Badley, who was an experimental psychologist, who was involved in the development of postcodes to make them memorable. And then what they did was break these big, long, complex, um, uh, random number sequences into meaningful chunks of information that are easier for people to remember. So that's why uh, you can remember your postcode much better. We've just had postcodes uh, down in, in, in Ireland, in the Republic, and they're awful. They didn't take any experimental psychology, and nobody can remember any of them. They're just random codes of numbers, and anybody has, well, I can't remember my postcode at all. Uh, because they've just put together a whole other random set of random numbers and letters. So, um, thankfully, um, in the UK, you have a great experimental psychologist helping. 
But if you break information down into meaningful chunks, you will remember it better. Okay? Um, lots of information about visual associations and, and imagery you can have as well. So, next thing is it's a little bit, I was going to kind of hurtle towards the end, is a bit about more the practical, modifiable, simple things that you can do to just keep yourself well. Okay? So, the first thing is doing what you're doing here. Seek information. Get as much information as you can. There is a real tendency when you're dealing with a chronic illness or a really difficult situation is to avoid and not think about it and not deal with it and hope that it goes away. Okay? Um, and that is not the right thing to do with any chronic illness. Okay? Now, Avoidance is a good thing in certain circumstances. For years, as psychologists, we were told we have to help people with denial and avoidance and stop those things. It's terrible. But actually, we realize now that avoidance and denial are very useful things, particularly in situations where you can't change the outcome and when you can't, or you have no control over the situation. But in this situation, it's really important that you learn as much as you can about your condition, learn about its treatment, and learn about the things that you're doing. So, very nature that you're here. You've already ticked the first box, so well done. Um, stress management. Now, these are things that have developed. We've heard it touched on already. There's some really good techniques out there now. And we're still learning about it. We're still learning about its value in, in Huntington's disease and at different stages of Huntington's disease. But we've got great data now for healthy people, people with other chronic illnesses, uh, and they're becoming really <coughs> useful, these, these um, anxiety management techniques. And we'll probably find, like we do in everything in Huntington's, different things will work and will be beneficial at different stages of the disease for different people. But certainly there is information out there to help. So this is, these are some trials that we're starting to do now in Dublin as part of our kind of general research program and, and we, we're incorporating our Huntington's patients and other uh, neurodegenerative patients into mindfulness-based and stress reduction groups as well. So mindfulness is a really, it's a really, it's a, I, I can just check, how many people have heard of mindfulness? That's amazing, right? Okay, I mean, I did this 10 years ago, there was a soul uh, put their hands up. And everybody thought it was some strange, arcane, Eastern thing that we were going to come in. And actually, I was given out to my priest once to say that I was, um, we were going to start putting strange ideas into people's heads about different ways of uh, thinking about things. So now, everybody knows it, and it's very familiar. And the reason why is because it's very beneficial. Uh, and there are two parts to it. Okay, I still struggle. Has anybody actually done, can I have anybody done mindfulness? Okay. How many people are really good at it? <laughs> it's really hard, uh, isn't it? It's really hard. I struggle with that, um, and I struggle with aspects of mindfulness um, to try and do it. And I've got colleagues of mine who are fantastic master trainers, and they're very good at it, and they're very serene, calm people. I struggle with that. I think my attention deficit struggles with that. But you've got to keep at it, all right? And the very times that people need it, and this is what has reminded me, I was told recently by one of my colleagues, I said I couldn't, I didn't have the time to do any practice. She said, well, the very time, you, you know, the very times in your life when you don't think you have the time is the time you should be doing it more often. So uh, she put me back in the class. So the important thing is about relaxation. And what I'm going to hit here is just simply the relaxation aspect of mindfulness. Life is busy, life is stressful. And we actually get into a pattern of behaving every so often that we even forget what it's like to feel calm. And sometimes when we're in, in sessions with patients, what I would do is just a simple relaxation exercise to help people see the difference between the tension that they can. People come in like this, really tense. And they forget how it feels like to just be calm for a minute. And even way, it might not stop the disease, it may not change the disease, but you'll feel better for a little while. And it might take away some of that anxiety, and we know it helps with some of the thinking and concentration pieces. So if you get a chance to do some mindfulness and even some relaxation exercise, and I'll give you some references to things at the end, try it and have a go. It's really valuable, really worthwhile, but you've got to practice it. Uh, even five minutes breathing, lying on the bed every day is really valuable. Even just sitting in traffic, uh, <coughs> we don't want to fall asleep. Um, so stress management techniques like that. The diet is really valuable. I'm sure you'll hear more about that, particularly in Huntington's disease, it's extremely really important. Alcohol is a real problem that we, we obviously see across um, the world now. It's a real issue that can affect and magnify cognitive difficulties. It can make you more likely to be irritable. I'm not going to say who was staying here last night or who was staying here tonight. If there's any alcohol involved, I'll make no judgments. Uh, just mind yourselves, uh, because it can affect and it can increase falls and all those other things as well. Exercise as well. I'm not a physio, I'm not an exercise person, but these are all the, these are the big ones. These are the old favorites. You've heard these a thousand times before that we need to, to put into place. But we forget about it when we're wrapped up in the middle of these things. And when our life is overwhelming and everything is very stressful, we forget that these are the old favorites that we need to do. Small bit of exercise, good diet, minimize alcohol use, stop your smoking, look at your stress management, and look at your sleep. You already heard the sleep as well. The sleep hygiene we talk about. That doesn't mean being clean. It means really your behaviors around sleeping. So it means making sure that, um, and nowadays, okay, here's another question for the audience. How many people go to bed with a, an iPad or a, a phone of some kind? Oh, look at this. 
Uh, okay, so this is one of the things. Now, uh, one of the things we see in speed difficulties is that the, the, the blue light. Have you heard of, have you heard of this issue? The blue light? You all know it, you see. You know it. Uh, but we still don't do it. Um, this blue light concept is that you, you know, you're, you're, you're stimulating your, your system. And it's not only the light, it's the fact that you're, you're, you're generally not reading something boring. You're doing something exciting. You're probably playing a game. You're, you're shooting something or kicking in something or trying to fill out. So you're, you're stimulating yourself. And what happens is, when you go to your bed and going to bed is really about um, you know, you're training your brain to sleep. And so you want to get into the routine of sleep. I'm not going to touch on anything else. I'm just going to say sleep, okay? Um, so sleep is a, it's about <coughs> making sure that when you're going to bed, it's a quiet environment, it's, it's a nice calming environment. Try to avoid um, anything you know, like that from the, from the blue light and the stimulation of those, of the exercises, of the, uh, all the games and apps that you can do. Because that stimulates you and makes it much harder to go to sleep. Um, so there's a lot of information you can get out there, and you don't need to worry about writing all these down. I, I can send them up to, to Sorka or uh, Patricia, and you can get them. These are just resources that are available. There's an awful lot more available in the NHS uh, than, we have, than, than we have in the HSE, so I'm, I'm shamelessly stealing lots of things uh, from all over the place, but I'll give you the references to that. But there's a lot of really useful information about depression, the mood, and anxiety, and you also have access to your mental health teams who can help that. But the one thing that I really want to try and do is just get into your head this concept of self-management. So it's about taking control of the way you think and feel about the disease and how you manage the, the illness around the disease. And control the pieces that you can control, because there are a lot of elements there to that. And while the disease is at a manageable stage, do at each stage what you can do to manage it. I know we're also wrestling with a condition that does affect our thinking and our problem solving and our movements and our independence. But this is really about trying to do the best you can while you can. It's playing a much more active role. So this is something that you can have access to in Bowman, I don't know if anybody's seen this. So this is in Bowman Hospital where I am, we put together a whole lot of information about mindfulness and relaxation and put it up on the website. We've got a lot of ones recorded. So um, what you'll see is a whole a lot of information there about that. It's, it's free to use. There's a lot of audio tracks. We've got new ones done now as well, which have mindfulness and relaxation exercises. Not as many Californian whale sounds as you'll probably hear on other um, mindfulness tracks, so they're a little bit more focused. Um, but you can, you can log on to it, you can, that's the website there at the top, uh, you can download it, you can have a listen to it. The, the nice one is the, the one on the top left, the relaxed breathing, it's five minutes. It's just a lovely thing to put on and just relax and just give yourself five minutes to, to, to chill out. So just have a go, have a go at some of them, there's plenty of them out there, but these are ones that we got done properly with our colleagues and wrote in all our uh, colleagues from neurology and psychiatry and psychology, got everybody in to, to record different ones. So you can all listen to them and have a go. So there's a lot of resources out there. Psychological therapy, we've heard already, can be very valuable as well as a, as a supportive system with your, your mental health team. So that will help you understand the condition, understand stress and anxiety, put the interventions into place that you, you'll need to do. The problem is, we need to find and we need to make sure we've trained enough psychological therapists and psychologists and, and mental health nurses who understand Huntington's disease, because sometimes that can be a challenge, that people are really they're not quite sure what they're dealing with when they're working with people with Huntington's disease. But that's also where you come in. This is where you come in in terms of your self-management. You have to educate people about that. And I'm sure you do this all the time. You're educating GPs, you're educating other health professionals about your illness. But it's important that you do that so that they understand what to do. So those of you who are, you know, one of the things we're trying to roll out, and we're hoping we might be able to work with, with our other colleagues to roll this out across the country, are the <coughs> Better Health, Better Living programs. We're, we're doing it, we now have it in, in MS and Parkinson's and other conditions where we train people in teams. These are six week, two hours a week, multidisciplinary um, teams, learning about trying to manage your illness and you do with everything from you know, medication management to um, exercise and relaxation and diet and all those things. And they're really good programs. They're, they're rolling out all over the place now. They're chronic disease self-management groups and they're really excellent. Um, and we're hoping to see the, the, these start to have an effect in Huntington's. So what we see, and this is probably what you might, have, you might have seen me referring to as we go along, is that there are obstacles to self-management. So if you don't know enough about information, maybe you just can't really get the energy up to doing it, you don't want to do it. Maybe there isn't the family support, or maybe, people, or maybe there's some conflict there. And these are all things that need to be, you need to help. So, some, some more information, shamelessly stolen from the NHS as well, in terms of advice. Um, these are just simple, positive steps. And again, you don't need to look at other things. You can, you can come back. I, I, I can send them to you. There's a lot of information there. Just about basic, These are just basic things that can be there for the person with Huntington's or their family members. And as I said, if the family members are happy and well and, and, and looked after, then it makes it easier to mind um, the person as well. So you see there's lots of information. There's lots of strategies and, and techniques there. I'll send them to you. You don't need to worry about writing them on I mean, the common issue that we're trying to break is this, is this kind of simple vicious circle. That you feel bad, 
You know, you kind of maybe do bad stuff, essentially. So you do things that are not good for you, or you don't do things that is good for you. That makes you feel bad, and then you continue around uh, in this vicious circle. And we want to break that vicious circle, and it is very, very breakable. Are you all okay? Are you all still with me? Yeah. That's right, and lunchtime is hurtling towards you, know, I can see it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take too much time. Uh, I'll fast forward that. One of the things I want to talk about here, um, before I finish, um, is just the caregiver piece as well. So one of the things that we're trying to do, we're working with, with Patricia and the HDAI as well, and we've been doing with, with motor neuron disease, is trying to make sure that we look after our caregivers and the people who are, who are providing care. It's very often that they get ignored and they get lost to the system, particularly because they don't have time to mind themselves, they don't have time to look after themselves because they're doing so much. And we do know that um, symptoms such as the behavioural change, the psychiatric difficulties, the personality change, they're some of the biggest factors that influence difficulties in people who are caring <coughs> with a neurological condition. So we talk about caregiver burden, um, and caregiver burden gets broken broke down into two parts. One is the, the physical burden, um, and in particularly our patients with motor neuron disease, it's a very heavy physical burden in caring for somebody with motor neuron disease. Um, but also then there's the emotional burden, which is the challenge of seeing a loved one, care, somebody that you care about, going through a very challenging time. And that seems to be one of the biggest factors that increases the burden on, on caregivers. Most caregivers can cope with the physical piece, it's the emotional burden uh, that is really, really hard. The behavioural change, the personality change, probably being the hardest from our data that we have so far, is the one that really causes the difficulty for everybody. And we want to, we want to help try to mind people with uh, our caregivers. So we're hoping to try and get some caregivers groups. There's a new group that's set up in Stanford. They've just produced um, a new six-week group for caregivers of all types of people with different neurological conditions called Building Better Caregivers. And it's a six-week, um, two-hour-week program for, for training caregivers to mind themselves and also help look after themselves. And this is something we're about to start a, a control trial of now to see whether it's effective in Huntington's disease. But it's really important that as caregivers, when you're going into the clinic and you're talking to your team, don't be afraid to say what's wrong with you. Don't be afraid. I know it's really hard in a, in a busy clinic as well, when they're looking after your relative. I know it's really difficult. But if you are struggling, it's important that you talk about it and it's important you ask for help as well, because it's going to help. So I'm going to stop now in a second. I'm just going to talk about two quick things. One of them is just the Enroll program that uh, you've probably heard already. Many of you know already about Enroll. Okay, so you don't need to do uh, we have some experts here with Enroll, but we've started an Enroll program, we, we put the site for Ireland in uh, 2015, and we've been slowly developing it. Uh, Enroll is a, is a multi, and I thank to the CFDI for giving me the, the slides for this, but it's a multinational um, program designed to gather as much information as we can about Huntington's disease over many years. So we, it's annual visits where you come and you undertake assessments of thinking, you get a medical review, mental health review, get blood given. And this goes into a, into a big database um, where we start to learn as much information as we can. So we're running out of, out of Bowman now. I think we've got 35, 36 people in it coming back to... Uh, I can send all this other information or you can get it from the website as well. But, um, so I'll show you what we have at the moment. This is the most recent information I've been given. Uh, David, you might have more, even more up-to-date information than this. But I think we've over 16,000 people in the Enroll program around the world, which is pretty amazing, really, in terms of the amount of people involved in this program to try and learn as much as we can about Huntington's disease. There's no other site in Ireland at the moment, apart from our site. Um, and um, in the UK and Ireland total, but the most recent one was two, over 2,000. We have 37, which is a very small starting, but uh, we're getting there. We have a long list of people who are interested, and um, we have up to four years worth of visits now coming. And we're slowly developing. We now have a full-time staff member working at it, and we now have a, have a couple of regs in psychiatry and neurology now. So we have a bit more people, but we really still want to make it a small clinic so that we can give enough time to people and their caregivers to participate. But we're hoping to expand that now a bit more. So if anybody's interested in that, um, you know, I'll just obviously go through the Enroll uh, website or contact us, or Patricia has our details as well. I think it's up on the HDAI website as well. We did have some struggles there for a while about knowing whether or not people from Northern Ireland could participate in the project, because it was all issues about different hospitals, different healthcare systems. I'm not even mentioning Brexit and what that might do or not do. So we're, gonna, we're just going to ignore all that. So I've decided, we've decided to just ignore all of that. So if people are from, from, from Northern Ireland want to participate, we now have some people participating, and that's, that's really positive. So I, I'm going to stop now because you need to get your lunch. Um, but I mean, the main thing is we know Huntington's is a complex, progressive degenerative disease. We know that up to now, the, symptom, the, the treatment has been symptom management. We're all very excited for the first time in many years that something might be on the horizon. But that doesn't mean we still should ignore the management, the self-care, the things that we can work on. And there's a lot that we can. These modifiable factors that maybe or may not hold off the disease for longer, but will certainly make you feel better and will allow you to stay independent for as long as possible. Because that's what we want to do. We keep you independent and functional and active. So there's a lot of help out there, and we really want to try and keep capitalizing on that. 
So, cognitive difficulties, first of all, are very common, right? Don't worry necessarily if you've noticed those things that I talked about already. The brain is an inefficient and kind of vulnerable organ, even though it's pretty impressive. It still makes mistakes all the time. You can get assessments to identify what the difficulties are, and the mental health aspects can also draw down and change your thinking, but there's help there for all of So I want to thank everybody, and thank you all for listening, and thanks for the invite today. If you have any questions, I'll be hanging around for a little bit, so I know we probably all want to go and get some lunch, but thank you for your time and attention. Appreciate it.